Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. If you cast your mind back a few weeks, you'll remember that we found a DKtronics joystick interface in one of our eBay boxes. I gave it a quick test, and unfortunately it doesn't work. And not only does it not work, it totally breaks the spectrum. This is the screen that we get. So that's an opportunity for a repair video. But I thought it would be interesting to try and reverse engineer the thing, see how it works by examining the PCB, taking a look at the chips on there, the data sheets, and just trying to figure out how they've designed this thing. So let's get these rusty screws out of the back. They'll need to go in acid, and we'll have a look at what we've got inside. First impressions, it doesn't look very good. I can see there's joints shorted. That might be by design, I'm not sure, but there's at least a couple. Um, it's kind of mucky looking, there's lots of uh, flux left over. We've got dry joints, and it's definitely going to need an overhaul. But first of all, I want to try and figure out how all of this works together. As far as I understand it, a Sinclair joystick only works by emulating key presses. So the computer thinks that you're actually pressing keys on the keyboard when you're using your joystick. That means that we can't begin to figure out how the joystick interface works without first learning how the keyboard works. This is going to give us an understanding of how the computer reads from I.O. devices such as keyboards and joystick interfaces. Here we have a keyboard membrane and a schematic that shows how it's wired up. You'll notice there are five columns. These correspond to the five wires on the right hand side of the membrane and eight rows which correspond to the left hand side. The columns come from the ULA chip on the Spectrum PCB and the rows come directly from the computer's address bus. It's important to know that all 13 wires ultimately aren't connected to anything if a key isn't being pressed. This means they're all floating and they don't interfere with the address bus. The wires are arranged in a grid as described by the schematic with each intersection um, corresponding to one of the 40 keys on the keyboard. When you press a key, it connects two wires at a particular intersection, connecting the computer's address line to the ULA chip. From there, the computer can deduce which key has been pressed, and it does this by scanning the keyboard for key presses like this. While the keyboard is being scanned, the logic level of all five columns is held high by the pull-up resistors seen at the top of the schematic. The rows are scanned 50 times per second, and the CPU scans the rows by setting all eight of the keyboard's rows to logic high, or 1, and then pulling each address line to logic low, or 0, in turn. It looks something like this, although not necessarily in this order. The five columns are staying at high because no keys are pressed, so they're not being pulled down. But let's say we press the 6 key. Nothing is registered until the corresponding row is pulled to zero. Now we can see one of the columns has been pulled down with it. To see what happens next, we need to look to the board schematic. This section shows us the ULA chip and its five lines to the keyboard. Highlighting our scenario, we can see that the address line that corresponds to the row that holds the 6 key, A12, is connected to the ULA pin that corresponds to the column that holds the 6 key, keyboard 9. Using red for high and blue for low, this is what's happening. The ULA's job in all this is to relay the contents of its five keyboard lines onto the data bus, so let's zoom out and see where it goes. As it happens, keyboard 9 is relayed onto bit 4 of the data bus, D4, shown here. So this will be set to 0, and the other four data lines that correspond to keyboard 10 to 13 from the ULA will remain at 1. The CPU now knows that when it asked to read from the ULA, specifically from the row connected to A12, D4 went low with the address line, and therefore key 6 was pressed. But I'm not particularly satisfied with just saying that the CPU wants this and does that and reads this, so let's go into the ROM and have a look even deeper. Okay, here we go. Now I'm assuming some prior knowledge about how CPUs work here. I'm going to talk a lot about registers and flags. Um, so if you don't know what a register or a flag is, just think of a register as a single byte of memory within the CPU, and think of a flag as a single bit of memory within the CPU. The Z Z80 has uh, 
quite a lot of registers and flags which it can use in different ways and we're going to use a few of them here to scan the keypad. The first thing that happens is we load the value 2f into our L register and this is going to correspond to each of the rows, each of the eight rows that we're going to scan. You'll see that this value gets decremented um, eight, seven times, so eight values throughout this process. Next step, we're going to load FF into the D and E registers, and these registers are going to be used to store the key presses that are detected during the routine. We then load the B and C registers with FE. Now the uh, C register is holding the port address of the ULA chip, that's 254, and the B register is going to be a counter for us to count eight times. And um, it's just a coincidence that they're the same value actually. Next step, we read into the accumulator the value on port C. So we know C is 254, that's our ULA's address. So the CPU is looking towards the ULA for a data byte, and that is stored in the accumulator. The accumulator is kind of like a scratch pad for doing um, arithmetic operations within the CPU. Now we need to check if the data byte read in to the accumulator contains any key presses. So the first stage of that is to take the complement, which means to flip all the bits, all the zeros change to one and all the ones change to zero. We're then going to use an AND command with the value 1F. Now this value 1F is the byte which would have been read in if no keys were being pressed. So if we AND that with our accumulator, which means we get a 1 where both of the uh, corresponding bits were 1, in our case we come out with 1, so the CPU knows that a key has been pressed. The next line in our ROM jumps ahead if the value of the Z flag is 1. Now the Z flag is the 0 flag, and the 0 flag goes to 1 if the accumulator is all zeros. So in our case we have a 1 in our accumulator, so our Z flag is set to 0, and that means we don't jump ahead, we just carry on to the next line. This byte in the accumulator, which contains our key bits, is then loaded into the H register for use later, and then the accumulator is loaded with the contents of the L register. And remember the L register value corresponds to the row of keys which were being scanned at the time. We now need to use the contents of the H register and the contents of the accumulator to do some arithmetic to determine exactly which key was pressed. The first thing we're going to do is subtract 8 from the accumulator contents. This happens every loop. And then we need to shift all of the bits in the H register to the right one. So the 1 in our H register is going to jump off the end into the carry and then get popped into bit 7. Um, so what's important there is the carry was used. That's another flag. So at this stage our carry flag is actually set high and this line of code is trying to jump us out of the routine if that flag is not set. So our flag is set, that means we found a key bit and we can continue. Having found a key press, we're going to shuffle the D and E registers around a bit and drop the accumulator contents into the E register. And that means at this point we've scanned the keyboard, detected a key press, we figured out a code which corresponds to the exact key that was pressed and stored that code 27 into the E register. We now have a value between 0 and 27 in hex in our E register. That corresponds to any of the 40 keys on our keyboard. What happens now is a number of checks are performed on the values to make sure that the key is valid, to make sure that we're not pressing shift or symbol shift, in which case we have to do more stuff, and also to do with the various modes of the keyboard. Luckily we're just pressing a key in normal mode. And the way this is handled is the initial index of this table, 0205, the main key table, is added to our key press value. Let's say, for the sake of argument, our key value is 1. Then we add 1 to 0205 and get 0206, and that's used as an index to pull out the value 48 from this table, which corresponds to key H. Finally, we loop this 8 times, and we do that by shifting the B register to the left by a bit until that 0 falls off the end, and every time we do that, we decrement the contents of the L register by 1, 
and at that point we can continue knowing that we've scanned all eight rows of keys. Brilliant, so that's how the keyboard works. I hope I explained it well enough to follow, and if you're still with me, let's take a look at how our joystick interface interfaces with the spectrum. Of course it's via the edge connector. I lifted this diagram from Project Specky, which I hope is okay, and we need to consider which of these pins are interesting to us. So let's start by identifying all the pins we just talked about when we learned about the keyboard. We have our eight address lines, which correspond to each of the eight rows of our keyboard. We're going to need plus 5 volts for all our TTL chips, and we're also going to need a ground. I've marked both of these red. And finally we'll need the 5 data lines which correspond to the keyboard columns shown in blue. And there is one more thing we haven't considered yet. We're going to need to know exactly when the CPU is looking to the keyboard, or in our case the joystick, for an input. Now I think we're going to do this by looking at the IORQ and the read signals coming from the edge connector. Notice that there's a line over RD and IORQ. This means that they're active low. And what that means is the CPU is trying to read from an IO device when these values are 0. At all other times it will be 1. This is a really important concept in digital computer electronics. A line above a pin's name means active low. Now I think we can whittle this down a bit. If we look at the Spectrum joystick standard, we can see that the joystick keys correspond to keys 0 to 9. This is really neat because all of these live on two rows controlled by A11 and A12, so hopefully we're going to see that these are the only two address lines connected to our joystick interface. We can now start reverse engineering. These are the pins that are connected. We were almost right. We do have A12, but we don't have A11 which simply must mean that we only have joystick 1 from the Sinclair standard. We also do have A5 and A0, and I'll explain those in a minute. We've got plus 5 volts and ground, and we have the entire data bus rather than just the first 5 bits. We also have the two I.O. bits I mentioned, plus one extra which is M1. This one is low when the Z80 is fetching an opcode for its next instruction. I'm not sure why this is needed, maybe something to do with interrupts but let's carry on anyway. What about these unexpected A5 and A0 bits? We can see the explanation in this table. I mentioned that the CPU scans each of the 8 rows of the keyboard in sequence. Well, each scan corresponds to a different in command. In commands must have an address associated with them. I've shown the addresses here in decimal on the left and binary through the table. We can see that every address has a 0 at A0 and a single zero somewhere between A8 and A15. This is the zero that pulls the individual keyboard rows low, like we talked about before. The reason that A0 is always low is when the CPU scans an I.O. device, it must address that device's port number. The keyboard's device is the ULA, and the ULA's port number is 254, like we mentioned before. That corresponds to the last 8 bits in our address. Keys 6, 7, 8, 9, and 0 are the row scanned during IN 61438, which means A12 is 0 and A0 is 0. So that's why we have A12, like we expected, and A0 included in our circuit. Using A0, we can be fairly confident that the CPU is scanning the ULA and hence the keyboard, and A12 tells us that the CPU is scanning keys 6, 7, 8, 9, and 0, or our equivalent joystick keys as defined by the Sinclair joystick standard. And what about A5? We need A5 in case a Kempston joystick is being used. Kempston joysticks work off of the command IN31, and putting 31 on the address line means A5 is low, so that means this interface must also be capable of reading Kempston joysticks. OK, we know what pins are being taken from the Spectrum Edge connector and are feeding our interface, so let's start following traces. First of all, I've highlighted the three chips as this is obviously important when it comes to figuring out how this thing works. Notice that two of the chips are the same, so we only have two types of chip. The ground pins are hooked up like this. We can see that each of our three chips gets ground. That's good because they need that. And also the joystick part on the left gets ground. The 5 volt line is a little bit more complicated, but it basically goes to all three chips. That's good. 
and it goes to the joystick on the right hand joystick part. It also connects via a 10k pull up resistor and a couple of diodes to four of the logic pins on two of our chips. More about that later. Next, let's look at the I.O. bits that will tell us the CPU wants to know what our joystick is doing. They go the long way round, but they all clearly go to the same chip. That's neat. And now for the three address lines. Again, they all connect to that one chip, which is nice. A5 takes the long way around, and it also seems to surround two of the plastic connector clips. I don't know if that's by design. I think this chip on the right is a good place to start figuring out some logic. Here are its pins, and I'll mark the inputs we know about here. We've got A5, A0 and A12, going to A, B and C respectively, and RD, IO, RQ and M1 going to G2A, G2B and G1 respectively. The logic diagram for this chip gives us some useful information. Our three I.O. bits are basically connected to the same gate, the output of which will be high if the CPU is looking to the keyboard for an input, and low at all other times. The output goes to all eight of these output NAND gates. The way NAND gates work is that the output is always set to high or 1, unless all of the inputs are high. Only then do you get a zero out of it. What this means in our case is that the eight outputs of this chip, Y0 to Y7, will always be high unless the CPU is ready to receive a joystick input. So where do our three address lines come into it? Looking back to our input table, remember that when keys 6, 7, 8, 9 and 0, our joystick keys are being read, A12 and A0 are low, and A5 is high. I can represent this again with red and blue on the diagram, but rather than tracing all these lines we can simply look at the function table from the datasheet. Blank out the uninteresting rows and highlight our use cases. When our CPU is not reading from the joystick, all outputs are high. When it is reading from the joystick, Y1 goes low. What about these outputs then? Where do they go next? Tracing the board, we can see that Y0, 3, 4, 5 and 7 don't go anywhere. Y2 and Y5 are connected together and then to the right hand 367 chip via the line we identified earlier as being pulled high by the 10k resistor. Y1, which is what we're most interested in, goes directly to two of the inputs to the left hand 367 chip, so we better take a closer look at this chip. Once again, here are all the pins labelled up and Y1 connects to G1 and G2. Notice that G1 and G2 are active low. This means that the chip jumps into action when Y1 is low, and we figured out earlier that Y1 goes low when the CPU is reading from the joystick. So what does happen when this chip activates? This chip is called a tri-state buffer, which means its outputs have three states. They can be 1, 0, or high impedance. Tri-state outputs like this are absolutely critical for computers to work. You find them on any device that has to write to a bus, like a data bus. These devices, such as a CPU or a memory module or a joystick interface, may only write to the data bus precisely at their allotted time. All other times it has to be effectively disconnected, otherwise it will interfere with the other data on the bus and the computer won't work at all. This could be achieved by physically disconnecting the devices from the bus, not very fast or practical, or as is conventional, by using tri-state buffers like this. Our chip here presumably has its outputs connected to the Spectrum's data bus, and will only output to it when the chip is enabled. We know that the chip is enabled when Y1 is low, which only happens when the CPU is looking for a joystick input data on the data bus. Still with me? Good. I still haven't answered my own question. What happens when the chip activates? It's quite simple. The inputs, that's any pin starting with an A, are passed through to the outputs, any pin starting with a Y, and that's it, that's all the buffer does. I made an assumption just now that this chip's outputs are connected to the data bus. Let's check that before going any further. Yep, the eight data lines are connected in various ways through various diodes to the outputs of our two tri-state buffer chips. A simpler way to look at it is like this. Here is our left-hand chip, and here is the right-hand chip. 
Okay, great. So we know that when the Specky is reading our joystick, something is passed on to the data bus. But what? We need to trace the inputs to these chips. Yep, they all connect very neatly to our joystick ports, and we can mark these onto our diagrams. I've called them C1 for the right-hand port and C2 for the left-hand port. By looking back at our Sinclair joystick standard and our keyboard map, we can create a table to map each data line to a joystick command. This allows us to mark up the chip's diagram with joystick commands like this. And here it is for the left-hand port. So that pretty much explains how this interface works. For the left-hand port, the CPU wants to read from the keyboard keys 6, 7, 8, 9 and 0. These are the keys our joystick must hijack in accordance with the Sinclair joystick standard and at this exact time, tri-state buffers pass our joystick inputs through to our data bus. If any of these come out low, i.e. if the joystick is being used, then the low value will be detected and bam, our joystick works. But something feels wrong. Comparing the left-hand port's mapping with the standard pins for a Sinclair joystick, up and down are swapped. I won't lie, I spent quite a long time looking for my mistake, but eventually I gave in and googled the interface, and what I learned was, in fact, there is a known error with this interface where up and down are actually swapped. Get in. Right, phew, that was a lot of information, but how does it help us repair the thing? Well, it doesn't. In fact, as soon as I opened it up, I noticed that two of the data lines were shorted together by some messy soldering. So, let's fix that. There we go. Sorted. For good measure, let's reflow all the joints and clean it up a little bit. I used Surgical Spirit to clean the board, reflowed all the joints, cleaned it again, and put it back together. And now for a quick test. Unfortunately, I don't actually have a Kempston joystick, so I can only test the Sinclair standard port. I'll move the joystick like this. Left, right, up, down, fire. If this board had been designed to the standard, we should see 6, 7, 9, 8, 0. But what we got was what we expected, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, confirming that up and down are actually reversed. And that's that. I hope that was interesting. If you're still with me, then I assume you either enjoyed it or fell asleep. Either way, please subscribe, take a look at my Patreon page. I'm ramping up the effort with this channel due to a looming redundancy, so I don't expect anyone to contribute just yet, but it's free to follow, and there'll be more casual content posted there. Cheers, and thanks for watching.